Good morning, and welcome to Archetype Pattern Workshop. This is a Bible Scripture Research School. This school is... Now, in the school, we use and teach by the true and original name and titles for the Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been a property substituted by Lord. The true title or the word of son is Elohim. It has also been a property substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's name and God's name. We now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is a title and our Creator chose for Himself. Now Jesus is a name. But Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce a sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Now Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he's incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized in his pure spirit state on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose the cloud to symbolize himself, because a cloud is no particular or a descriptive shape and form. Now we have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state took on shape and to conform right with himself as Elohim. This is the Word or Son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. Now this shape and form can only be seen in a divine vision and understood in a divine revelation. Later on, the self-same spirit manifests itself in a physical body and walk the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah. The world calls him Jesus Christ. There's only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet challenging question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title could be had by reading the preface of the Holy Bible. Also in this school, we teach by a divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. And after Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern in a vision. Now he instructed Moses to build it exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, 
and the court round the mouth. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth in this school to prove that everything in the universe operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes this pattern. Now the ten names of the school are as follows. One is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and as he actually exists. Two is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah. Without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers late in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Six is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. And eight is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And nine is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained, there is no other name given among men, whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And ten is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the newer state. Our watchword is peace. Our slogan is speak the truth. This morning we have a prayer by Dr. Amir Ramirez. The scripture lesson is Psalms, the 150th division. And it will be read by Dr. Nanette Ramirez. And we have a selection of music after the prayer. Morning and good afternoon, class. We would like to ask Yahshua to give us some more understanding, knowledge, wisdom, and give us the strength to go on in these days. And we ask in your name, Yahshua Messiah, let us all say, Hallelujah.
Good morning, class. Good morning. I'll be reading Psalms 150. I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by the late A.B. Trina. Psalms 150. Hallelujah, praise El in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments, stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breathed breath praise Yahweh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Good morning once again. Sorry we started late, but we're in another location now. And uh, it took time to get set up. And we had a couple of you know, technical difficulties. But anyway, hi out there. We're ready to start. And uh, our first speaker would be Dr. Will Williams. And it's hot in here. Workshop. 
The whole idea, and this is what Dr. Kennedy showed for us, Elohim is the archetype of original pattern of the universe. Moses was told to replicate this pattern, which is the divine pattern of the universe here in the wilderness of Sinai. This is a pattern of heavenly things, okay? Now, if that be the case, then we have to see how this pattern with the spirit law inherent therein is controlling everything and that events are controlled and dictated by spirit law. As you see here on the elementary chart, we call it the elementary chart because this gives you a basic understanding about the pattern, not just the pattern, but the migratory pattern as well. Okay? Why? Because the migratory pattern represents the greater and more perfect sanctuary, which is the universe. Oh, I need a scripture later, do I need to this? Oh, you got one? Oh, you over there. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. Give me this slide. How about Hebrews 8 and 1? Hebrews 8 1. Hebrews 8 1, anybody? Here we go. In the back of the Bible. Okay. Hebrews 8 and 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Mm -hmm. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A mystery of the sanctuary. No, try it again. Oh, a ministry of the sanctuary. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. A minister mm -hmm. of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, mm -hmm. which Yahweh pitched, and not man. Now, Elohim is the true tabernacle right. that Yahweh pitched, and not the man. Elohim also represents the universe. And the universe in its totality is in two distinct parts. There's a physical creation, and there's an incorporeal creation, or an angelic creation. Okay? Now, that's represented, that's represented here. This is the migratory pattern. And I'm pointing to this one because it's right next to the tabernacle pattern. And the correlation between these two plates is what sets up your correlations on all these plates. Okay? The greater and more perfect tabernacle, which is Egypt, wilderness, Canaan's land, or physical creation, angelic creation, eternity, or spirit law. Here, we have the tabernacle here, we have these numbers. There's seven steps or seven levels. Okay, so to speak. And these are and this is imperfection because seven denotes perfection. Right. Okay, so Yahweh is operating in perfection. That's why you see a lot of sevens, okay, like seven ages, seven dispensations, seven vines, seven seals. Because Yahweh is operating in perfection. Lucifer, because he's on the veil, all right, he's operating in imperfection or one short of perfection. And his number is six. Okay? That's a way you can identify him. Alright? Now, in the operation of, of this tabernacle pattern, as compared to the migratory pattern, as I said, the steps and the correlations between these two plates is what you're going to use. Okay? With these principles of the spirit, the water, and the blood, or death, burial, resurrection, all right? Um, I need to add something else to this. Let's get Genesis, I think it's 26 chapters, Jacob's Ladder. It's Genesis 10. No, it's 26 chapters, no. Somewhere around this, might be the 10th verse. Mm -hmm. 28. 28, okay. 28 
Um, you want to start at 12? And he dreamed? No, go above that. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. Mm -hmm. And he lit light upon, was lit upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of the place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Okay, now. Jacob took some stones, made a pillow, and he laid down to sleep. Why? Sleep is a type of death. Okay? Read. And he dreamed. And he dreamed. Now he is immersed in a dream. Let's come down here. Jacob got some, some stones together, made a pillow, and went to sleep. That's a type of death. Then he dreamed. Now he is immersed in a dream. Okay, read. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heavens. All right, the top reached to the heavens. Now, the, the highest heaven is the third heaven, so it reached up to here, the most holy place. Okay, continue. And behold, the angels of Elohim ascending and descending on it. Now, the angels of Elohim ascending and descending on it. Okay, go ahead and finish it. And behold, Yahweh stood above it and says, I am Yahweh, the Elohim of Abraham, thy father, and the El of Isaac. The land thereon where thou liest to thee, will I give it unto, unto thy seed. Okay, good enough. Now, he's at the top of this ladder, which is the seventh step. Now, if I took this, each number, represents a step, and that would be like a rung on a ladder. The gate is the first number, it's the first step. Altar, sin, sacrifice is the second step, second one. Brazen labor is the third step, third one. The door with the cup of holy anointing go out there is the fourth step, or the fourth rung. The fifth step is the holy place with the principle of the light, the bread, the intercessor, that would be the fifth one. The sixth rung is the veil of blue, purple, and scarlet with angels embroidered on it. That would be the sixth rung. And the seventh rung would be the Ark of the Covenant, upon which that cloud which led them sat on top of the mercy seat but between two archangels. And inside was the tables of stone, most of the second tables of stone that he took up to be written into, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod and budded into almonds. Now these are just rungs on a ladder. Right. All right. Isaiah 28 and 9. <clears throat> I think I, <clears throat> I've worn the jacket long enough <laughs> just to be <laughs> civil. No. <laughs> but it's good. It's going to be warm in here. Right. I don't know what it's up with the air conditioning. But anyway. Isaiah 28 and 9. Mm -hmm. To whom, whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For a precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little. All right, now, Isaiah saying, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Well, Dr. Kennedy said this once in the lecture, he ain't gonna teach no knowledge if you don't know who he is. You know, you call him every other thing, but, but his name Yahweh or Tito Elohim or Yahshua. See, he ain't gonna teach you no knowledge. He ain't gonna teach you no knowledge if you insist right. on calling him by some other name. He ain't gonna teach you no knowledge. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Well, if you don't if you don't acknowledge who he is, he ain't gonna teach you anything. Really. Okay? Continue. No, wait a minute, before you go, let me say a couple of things since you did read the whole verse. I said, I said, precept upon precept. A precept is a principle. Right. A principle is, is simply this. A principle is something that is immutable. That simply means it does not change. A precept is perpetual. That means it goes on and on and on. In other words, it is eternal. A precept is Ir is irre irresistible. 
that means nothing can withstand it, you know. It'll just roll over you, and, you know, like a giant steamroller and crush you like a bug. Okay, now whatever you believe that doesn't follow those parameters, then chances are it's not a principle or a precept. Keep your finger there. First John 5 and 7. because we want to show you what these principles or these precepts are. Okay? 1 John 5 and 7. For there are three things that bear witness. The Spirit... No, you're not giving the holy name. I need the King James oh, Version. Okay, I got it. For there are three that bear record in heaven. So we should know that. Yeah. There are three that bear record in heaven. Uh -huh. Read. The Father. The Father. The Word. The Word. And the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit. And these three agree in one. And wait a minute, wait a minute. Is that what that says? These three are one. <laughs> Is that what that says in your Bible? No. I, I'm not reading it right. I, mean, I didn't time. think so. <laughs> it just come out that way. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Are one. Are one. See, they don't agree as one. I mean, if you they say that, one. if you say that, then, then you <laughs> infer a trinity. Yeah. You got three individuals, you know, like, hey, we're going to get in the football hall. So what do you think, you know? How are we going to do this Holy Spirit? What do you think about that son? You know? <laughs> See, and that's not what we're trying to impart here. So there's no trinity thing going on right. here. See, this is a unity, let me have it right here, unity of the Spirit. See, why? Because Spirit is the source and substance of all things, and manifesting itself into two distinct parts, the angelic creation and the physical creation. These are two manifestations of pure spirit. In other words, they are his witnesses. See? And that's what Yahweh is. He's not individualizing himself. See? When he comes in this, oh, let me say something, this is part of this. When he comes here, he takes on this shape and form. This is Elohim taking on shape and form in part, not in totality. However, that which is in this is the law of the Spirit incorporealized. This heart here is him incorporealized. And this is the creation right here. This is the beginning of the universe right here. Right. Yahweh, pure spirit, took a back seat, or in other words, went into his rest. See, he went out of business. That's how Dr. Kimley used to say it. He went out of business and the Son did the work. This is the Word of our Son. Now this Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But this was the same law of the Spirit operating because of what he did no man could do. Right. He was said, raised the dead, said the wind and the seas would obey. That was the law of the Spirit personified in the flesh. Okay? Now, so now these three are one. Okay, now we can continue with that. And there are three that bear witness in the earth. Uh huh. The earth. Witness. That are witnessing earth. The spirit. The spirit. And the water. The water. And the blood. And the blood. And these three agree in one. Now these three agree in one. They are witnesses to his, to him. How? Continue reading. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of El, uh, Yahweh is greater, for this is the witness of Yahweh, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth in the Son of Yahweh, believeth not Yahweh, hath made him a liar. Excuse me. He that believeth on the Son of Yahweh hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not Yahweh hath made him a liar. Because okay. All right. Now, you, you have the witness in yourself. Mm -hmm. See? Everybody that's walking around alive have blood running warm in their veins. You have water, you have a spirit. These are the precepts or the principles. That's why this chart is made the way it is. So that you would say a line. Here's a bloodline. Alright? Here's a bloodline. All the way across the chart. So you want to see the principle of blood there. Not only that, get 1 Corinthians 15 and 3. And I haven't forgotten Isaiah 28. Because we're going to go back to that, but I'm just bringing this stuff up so that you can see what's happening with this. You said 2 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 15 and 
read it. First Corinthians 15 and 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Yahshua died for our sins mm. according to the scriptures. Now how he died, see, which is the same as blood. Right. Read. And that he was buried. He was buried, which is the same as water. Read. And that he rose again the third day. Which of, is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. According to the scriptures. Which is the same as spirit. So when you talk about blood, water, and spirit in an ascending way, you can apply death, burial, resurrection. See? You can apply that, okay? These are the clues and the, uh, 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 the precepts that you'll see, not just on these charts. These, well, this, what's on the charts is really a reflection of what's in the scriptures. Right. And they're just illustrated that way so that you can get an idea as a primer. But as you begin to go through this, you'll begin to see other stories, other passages that, that follow the same pattern, though it may not be illustrated up here. Okay, now go back to Isaiah. Isaiah 28 and 11. Mm -hmm. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now, Moses was a stammerer. He complained to Yahweh. He stuttered. You know, Yahweh said, well, what about your brother Aaron? He's a good, he's a good talker. The reason why I know because I'm down here with him, talking to him as I'm asking for projecting out here to this boy burning bush, talking to you. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I know he speaks well. He'll be your mouthpiece, okay? So Aaron met Moses out here in the wilderness of Sinai, and the two of them went down together to render judgment upon Pharaoh, the law, and the prophet, okay? Keep reading. To whom he said, this is the rest, mm -hmm. wherewith he may cause the weary to rest, mm -hmm. and this is the refreshing, yet they will not hear. Mm -hmm. But the word of Yahweh, was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept. See, see that, that's the thing. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. See, that's what you do. Now somebody says, you know, well, I, I don't believe this. Well, hey, you know, you take it off yourself. And you put it on Yahweh. Put it on the pattern. Mm -hmm. See, People can deny this, but they cannot truly successfully refute right. this. It's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, so you're in Isaiah, get 8 and 20, and then, we'll, and then we shall conduct our exercise. Isaiah 8 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Okay, now, that's, that's the key. See, the law is the first five books of the Bible. Exodus, I mean Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then the books from Joshua to Malachi that consist of the testimony. All right. It's the law. I'm pointing the Elohim here because he is the law of the Spirit. Right. And here's the creation coming forth from him. That would be like the testimony, in principle, so to speak. Okay? So you have to use the law and the testimony. Here, Yahshua the Messiah is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. See? Because it all pointed to him and what he is going to do. How he's going to fulfill these cardinal ordinances, 613 of them, bring them to an end, and then bring in a new testament written in the heart and in the mind, okay? And see, that just goes to our three tenets, the unity of the spirit and the, and the names, the institution and the fulfillment of these cardinal ordinances, and last but not least, the divine pattern of the universe, okay? So, let's like say, but I don't have any particular subject I want to delve in, as the girl in England says, let's go with the raffle. <laughs> 42 numbers in this church.
shark. And then and yet it comes when you play the exercise. I said, well, why is that? Well, the first 40 numbers does correspond to the 40 plates on the 40 plate chart. Right. If you happen to choose number 41, if you choose 41, then you have to explain this plate. This is called spiritual temple plate. All right. The explanation for it is in the fourth volume of our textbook. If you pick number 42, then you have to explain the circles mm -hmm. on top of this chart. These circles is really Dr. Kinley's first attempt at a chronology chart, because that's what they are. These circles represent the chronology of the purpose of Yahweh. Dr. Kinley was gracious enough to, you know, to flesh it out, so to speak. You know, with all the dates and lines and dispensations, you know, mapping it out. But it started off <clears throat> with these circles. Okay? So now that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> that's what we want to do. Gentiles with the Gentiles 
you know, uh, as far as the dispute right. you know, among them. But also, Peter is also here being profiled right. in the resurrection we confirm. So, one goes into the other. Okay? Uh, I need to keep a command on time here. Okay. I got at least a good hour. All right. I know we did start late. Okay, so we apologize for that. All right. Let's get at the ninth, uh, the tenth chapter, the ninth verse. Acts 10 and 9. On the morrow, as we went on their, on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to, to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they had made ready, he fell into a trance, and he saw and, and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him. Okay, hold it right there. Now, let's look at this. Peter's on top of the house top, and it's at noon, because you like just say the six hour of the day. Right? right. Yes. That's 12 noon. In other words, the sun, I'm talking about the S-U-N, is in the zenith, mm -hmm. and he's on the house top, so he's in the most holy place. And then read that last verse again. 11, and saw heaven open. Now he saw heaven open. Open. Why did it open? Mm -hmm. Where are we at here on the pattern? See, yeah. that's the sixth step. Why? Let's draw a line. Draw a line. What opened over here? Did the Jordan River right. open? Right. Right? Come on back over here this way. Draw a line. And see, back here, the veil in the temple mm -hmm. made in twain. Did it not open? See, that's how you make the correlation. By correlating with the events, either on the migratory pattern, or in the tabernacle. So now, and also we started up here instead of here. Why? Because the story starts here. Because remember when we read about Jacob's ladder, what were the angels doing? Mm -hmm. Ascending and descending. Uh, they were ascending and descending. Mm -hmm. And that's what these plates do. Either ascending or descending. This is a descending story because why? The story starts here. Mm -hmm. And it's going to descend down as we'll read according to the scriptures. Okay? So now, it was an opening. Continue reading. And saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him. And it had been a great sheet fastened at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manners of four the beasts of the earth. Okay, now all, there was a sheet. Why a sheet? Mm -hmm. See, draw a line. See? It's a veil in the tabernacle, right. and four-footed animals were on it, you know, and, and read. And wild beasts, mm -hmm. and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Yahweh, for I have never eaten anything for that is common or unclean. And okay, hold it the, right there. Now, in other words, he sees these animals. Right. And, 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 and Yahweh says, right, Peter, slay and eat. And Peter's like, no, 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 because he, he understood the law. He said, now, according to the law, most these animals were, were forbidden. And he said, not so, nothing unclean or uncommon. That's what he meant by it. In other words, it wasn't, see, in the, look at it, right here. See, in the law of Moses, there were certain animals that they could not eat, okay? And Yahweh is telling them to eat that. He said, oh, I can't do that. But, but read. And the voice spoke unto him again the second time. But Yahweh had cleansed that call not thou common. Okay, now Yahweh has cleansed them. So don't call them common anymore. Why? Let's draw a line. Draw a line. Right here in the most holy place. Here we got the Abrahamic promise. Right. What was the promise given to Abraham? That through his seed, singular, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That includes Jew and Gentile. Okay? Now, here, here's Peter on the rooftop, and he sees this. Here's another correlation I like to do. Um, if, I, if I see it, I 
When she read about the, when Peter was on the housetop, and he said that the, the sheet was tied at four corners, all manners of animals mm -hmm. and creepy things, and that reminded me of the garden, when, uh, because it is in the most holy place. Yeah. You know, corresponds to that thing. Or correlates. It's probably the sixth day of creation. Is that where it's the cloud and the cloud that has all the animals in there? And Seven hundred guys who were rulers, 
who were kings of their own country. And so every year they would come, and they would come out here to Solomon's Temple Hill on a certain day, feast day. And you have to remember, Solomon's Temple was a porch, a sanctuary, and an oracle. The porch of Solomon's Temple was divided into the porch was a, a, a porch for the Jews, mm -hmm. a porch for a, 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 a court for the a court for the Jews, a court for the priests, and a court for the Gentiles. Okay? And Solomon would come out and he would greet his in-laws and they would bring their wives with them. These kings. Alright? So but Solomon would come out there and he would greet them, you know, because he's the king, he's the host, and they would be and they're out there, you know, he's on the veranda and they're out there in the court, and now he's standing up there talking about Solomon, the king, a type of king of kings because they're in the court there. I'm talking about in the court of the Gentiles. Right. The kings that were, so that's a type of that. Just like Adam, because see, when he named them all off, they were the kings and queens of their species, so he was king of kings in a type. You see the same thing with Solomon. Why? Because Joshua the Messiah, he is the true, he is the true king of kings. All right? Ruler of rulers. Got it right here, ruler of rulers, okay? Now let's go back to Acts. I just wanted to draw that out because it's about, about what the Gentiles see. And see, hopefully it'll be germane when we get over here. But go back to Acts and let's continue reading. 12, 10 and 12. Mm -hmm. Wherein, if all manners forfeited beasts of the earth, wild beasts and creeping things, and fowl of the earth, and there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat, but Peter said, Not so, Yahweh, for I have neither eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spoke unto me again the second time, What Yahweh has cleansed, thou call not common. This was done thrice. Okay, that was done thrice, so three times. Why three times? Mm -hmm. Come on over here to the migratory pattern. How many times did Moses go up that mountain? Three. See, how many times did the high priest go up here on the Day of Atonement? Three. How many times did Yahshua the Messiah check on his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane? Three times. Let's see. How many times did Noah let out the dove? Three times. You see what I'm saying? They're all correlated. All right? Continue. The vessel was received up again into heaven. Now, while Peter wondered what this vision which he had seen to me, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiries for Simon's house and stood there before the gates and called and asked where the Simon which was surnamed Peter were lodged, was lodged there. Well, Peter thought on this vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down and go with them. Okay, now, just to keep you from reading a whole lot. This is Cornelius, all right? He's a Gentile, all right? And uh, I think that, go, go to the first verse in that chapter. What does it say? There was a certain man, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, a one that feared Elohim, which all of his house, which gave him alms, to the people and pray to Elm always. Okay, now that was that's who Cornelius was. He was a centurion, you know, of the Italian band, meaning he was a Rome. I mean he was a, not just a Roman citizen, but he was a Roman Roman, you know, from Italy. Okay? Alright, now the point I wanted to make is that Cornelius, see, is the same uh, centurion I think it's Luke, the seventh chapter. servant was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. 
And when he heard of Yahshua, he said unto him, the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. We can't hear you. Speak loud. And when, and when he heard of Yahshua, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come unto and heal his servant. And when they came to Yahshua, they besought him instantly, saying that he besought him that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Yahshua went on with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Yahweh, Trump, Yahweh, Rabbi, how about that? Rabbi, I trouble not. Speak into the mic, please. Because, I mean, really, because it's hard for the, for the phone mic to, to pick up. Yahweh, trouble not thyself, right? No, Rabbi. Rabbi, trouble okay. not thyself, for I am not worthy of that thou shouldst enter unto my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say unto in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I am also a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and they doeth it. When Yahweh heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him around and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. Okay, now, <clears throat> the centurion who met Yahshua, all right, and, and, and stopped him from coming and said, no, you, you don't have to come, just say the word. Right. And I know it will happen, why? Because I'm a centurion, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a man of authority, you know. He would be like, I guess, comparatively speaking, like, uh, I don't know, like a warrant officer, I guess. Compared to us, and you know, because he was like the liaison between the troops mm -hmm. and, the, and the upper command, all right. And a centurion, you know, just by his name, see, the word century is the root word of centurion, which means that he had a command of at least over a hundred people, mm -hmm. okay. And so he gives an order, you know, say, you know, do this. And there's no thing like, you know, well, why do you want me to do this? No, <laughs> no you just do it. Because that's your orders, you know. Good soldiers, you know, follow follow the orders, you know, obey orders, so to speak. All right. And so now he's saying, you know, I'm a man of authority, and I recognize you as a man of authority. Mm -hmm. All right. Just say the word, and I know it'll be healed. This is the same for Elias. Right. See that that's here with Peter. It's the same. So he had met he had met Yahshua in the flesh. Okay. And now here he is. After seven years, after the day of Pentecost, he's here at Peter's house, all right? Now let's go back to Acts, and I think you need to jump down to uh, maybe 30, 44, maybe, I'm thinking. 44? Well, Peter had spanked. Mm -hmm. Three words. These words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all them that heard the word. And they of all the circumcised which believed were astonished, as many came with Peter, because on the other nationalities also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify Yahweh. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water? Mm -hmm. That else that these should not be immersed, which have received the Holy Spirit? as well as we and he commanded them to be immersed in the name of Yahshua. Okay, now Christianity latches on to this thinking that he baptized them in water. Right. But he, he didn't, he immersed them in the name of Yahshua. You know, was he preached the gospel. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the Holy Spirit fell on them like it did the Jews with cloven tongues of fire. So he went to a line. That's like the last stand. Alright. And so Peter stood up, see, in the spirit in him, see, that would be like the intercessor. Draw a line. That would be like the altar of incense. Right. And the words that Peter spoke, you know, they are spirit and they are life. And that's the bread. Mm -hmm. That's the bread principle. See, just like 
table of soup right here. Okay? And it happened in AD 40. See, AD 40, that's the 40 principle. Why? Draw a line. How many years? When the Israelites out here in the wilderness of Sinai? Four years. See, how many weeks did it take to build this tabernacle? Forty weeks. Forty, you see? All of these things are co-related. Okay? All right? Uh, so you go to the next chapter. I need to... Uh, Acts 11. Uh, 11 and... Uh, yeah, 11 and uh, 15, because Peter, he went back to the other disciples, to the other apostles, and they heard about what happened to the Gentiles. They said, the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. Uh, how did that happen? But Peter, what did you do? Who, who sent you to preach to the Gentiles? And because, see, for seven years, they preached none of it but to the Jews and Jews only. Right. See, they didn't preach to the Gentiles about this. But now Peter, he's entertaining these Gentiles and preached to them. And the Holy Spirit fell on them as it did the Jews. So they're like, so he's kind of been being called on the carpet here. You know, what happened? How did this come about? And see, and so now he's rehearsed the matter and he's explaining it to his contemporaries. Read. Acts 11 and 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remember I the words of Joshua, how that he said, John indeed immersed with water, but ye shall be immersed with the Holy Spirit. For as much then as Yahweh gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on Yahshua the Messiah, whom was I, what was I, that I should withstand Yahweh. Then they heard these things, they beheld their peace, and glorified Yahweh, saying, Then hath Yahweh also to the nations granted repentance unto life. Okay, now he granted repentance unto life, unto the nations, or unto the Gentiles, okay? Now, and they were scattered, they had been still scattered, so they were going off, you know, from the persecution that started with Stephen. Right. Right, and see, and they went out and preached the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because they said, go ye, because that's the great commission. <laughs> go ye therefore into all nations, you know, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the right. Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not with water, but in the name of right. Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. Okay, so now here we're coming down to pagan persecution, and this and this guy right here, this guy here, this is uh, well, let's read him. Twelfth uh, chapter of Acts. Mm -hmm. Twelve Acts. Twelve and one. Mm -hmm. Acts twelve and one. Now about that time. Speak into the mic, please, because I want I want because you have you know because it's hard for the phone app to hear. Thank you. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church, and killed James, the brother of John, with his sword. Okay, now, okay, Herod. See, I said Herod the king. Now here's the question you should ask. Who made him king? Right. <laughs> Who made him king? Because if you remember, the last time we were dealing with the government, the Roman government, we were dealing with Pontius Pilate. Mm -hmm. He was just the governor. He was just a guy sent by the government to rule over them. Now we got this guy. He, he's king. king. So who made him king? Mm -hmm. See, it was Herod that did that. See, um, mm -hmm. what is it that? No, I suppose. Let's backtrack for a moment. Come over here. Here we got Stephen being stoned. Right. All right. Stephen is being stoned, and uh, and we got this dragon here. All right. Now the way Dr. Kendall explained it is a, a symbolic for pagan Rome. And see, and over here. Well, come over here. See this over here. See we have it here. This is the same plate with Stephen being stoned. Got pagan Rome here to draw a line. Then we got a letter here instead, instead of instead of Herod. Right. See now, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. See mm -hmm. here, pagan Rome gave us power. 
the paper world. That's what it's prefiguring. See, the, the transfer of power from one from one to another. Painted room, the paper room. That's manifested over here with Stephen. I'll, I'll use this here. Here's the dragon. See, because when when Yahshua the Messiah was executed by the Romans, the Jews, the Sanhedrin Council, did not have the, the authority to order an execution because the government was the Roman government. So they had to go to Pontius Pilate, all right, for permission. After, after Yahshua is executed, all right, even though he took an innocent, you know, he was innocent, he took a guilty man's place right. of that of Barabbas, who had been charged with murder and an insurrection. Okay? So the Jews, the Sanhedrin, they told Pilate, well, this guy here, he said he's king of the Jews and we don't have no other king but Caesar. All right? And so but he took another man's place. All right? So that put the mark on him. See, so now anybody that follows him was right. subject right. to reprisals. Because here, they stoned Stephen to death. They didn't ask permission of the Roman government. Why not? Because they had already executed Joshua, and he was considered to be the ringleader of this group of Nazarenes who said that he was the king of the Jews. So all they had to do is say, well, we're just mopping up the action. But just get the remnants, you know, the followers. You already executed the, the ringleader. We're just getting up the elements, all right? Gosh. Now, pagan Rome has given its power to the leper, or papal Rome in principle, all right? That means here with Herod, because Herod, he ordered the death of James, the brother right. of John. He didn't have to ask mm -hmm. the Romans for the for permission. He didn't have to bring him to Pilate or something. You know, he, he was king. He had the authority. They gave him the authority. So now, here he is. That's the death, see? The beheading of James, the brother of John, okay? Uh, keep reading. Acts, wait. Acts 12 and 1. Why, why are you reading 12 and 1? Just read that. 12 and 10. 12 and 2. 12 and 2. 12 and 2. And he killed James, the brother of John, All right. with the sword. Mm -hmm. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Okay, now, because he killed James, all right, the brother of John, that's the blood here. All right, draw a line, come over here. We still have that circle here, James. Gonna go. Now he put Peter in the prison, and he's marked for death. Okay, he put him in prison. All right. Go ahead. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarters for quarterlyans. What? Quaternions. Quaternions of soldiers to keep forth to keep, to keep him intending after Easter or to bring after Passover to bring him forth to the people. Okay, now he's surrounded by four quaternions of soldiers. Why four quaternions? All right. Let's see how many points of blood is on this altar of sin and sacrifice. Four. See, there's four points of blood here. How many points of blood did they have to put on the door of the Israelites' houses? Four. See, see what I'm saying here? All right. Now, this play here is called Resurrection. We confirm. Let's see if we can do something here. Uh, Uh, I'm looking for plate 31. 31? 31. 30. Yes. It must be wrong over there. Over there, on the end. This week we're doing the resurrection. We confirm. Okay? 
Now, let's look at that. Here's Peter. We say he's surrounded by four quaternions of soldiers, right? And we said what? It's just like what? On the altar of sin and sacrifice? Four points of blood. Four points of blood. For, right, what about the Israelites' houses? Four, four points of blood. blood. How about the option of the Messiah here? Four points of blood. Four points of blood. Why? Because he's got the crown of thorns, mm -hmm. nails in his hand, and nails in his feet. That's four points of blood, just like Peter is surrounded by four quaternions of soldiers. That's how you line that up. Okay? Keep reading. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing through the church unto Yahweh for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Okay, now hold it. He's sleeping between two soldiers, right? Yahshua died, right? What did they do with Yahshua's body? Put it to Put in Joseph's new tomb. See, what happened there? Put two soldiers there. They put two soldiers there. There's a lot because they said, well, the disciples might steal his body. Mm -hmm. So they treated Pilate to put a watch on there. So they put two soldiers. So Yahshua was asleep or dead, so to speak, sleeping between two soldiers. Mm -hmm. Just like Peter over here, he's sleeping here, or a type of death, between two soldiers. Crawling. Okay? Read. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, mm -hmm. and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of Yahweh came unto him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side, and raised him out, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. Okay, so now the angel came and smote Peter in the side. Right. Why did he do that? Mm -hmm. Draw a line. See this guy here with the sword? Right. See, he was going to break Joshua's legs, you know, because the Sabbath was coming, and, he, and you know, he wanted to get off work. And so he said, well, well, I'll break the legs, and I'll, you know, haste them to death. But he saw he was already dead, so he punched him in the side, not with came blood and water. Right. He punched him in the side, right? Just like Peter was punched in the side. Right. Come back up here to the migratory pattern. The lamb that they ate down in Egypt for the Passover, how was it killed? Pierced in the side. Pierced in the side. Drained the blood, blood drain. Drain. And no bones was broken. You see now how all of that is correlated? All right? Continue, Acts. Eight. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment above thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord. Now it opened on its own accord, right? Mm -hmm. it, or, or, so it appeared. It was really the angel that was making it open. Right. right? But draw a line. See? How did this tomb get open? Roll see, away. look here. See, see, there's an angel up here. It opened on its own accord, but we know there was an angel there that made it open on right. its own accord. You see, there's an angel there. Let's draw a line. Here's the Red Sea here. Mm -hmm. And there was a phenomenal cloud that led them. How did the Red Sea open? Mm -hmm. It looked like it opened on its own accord. Right. But there was an angel there, an angel in the cloud, that made the Red Sea open on its own accord. Right. You see now? See, that's all correlated. And this is Peter. See, this is resurrection reconfirmed. This happened in AD 33. Peter here is 10 years later in AD 43. See, to reconfirm the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Yahshua the Messiah. Okay? Read. When they were past the first and second floor, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them with its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of surety that Yahweh has sent his angel and has delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary the Mark, mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And he stood unto her, 
They are, thou art mad, but she constantly affirmed that it was even so, and said that it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoning unto them, said with his hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how Yahweh had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Okay, good enough. Now, the point here is Peter, when he resurrected, the first person he saw was a woman, right. which was Rhoda. All right, let's go back over here. When Yahshua came out, let's read that. I think it's in Mark. What I want. Mark uh, 16 and 9. Mark 16 and 9. And on the first day on which he arose, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Mm -hmm. Now he appeared unto Mary Magdalene, because when he came out, he came out, Mary Magdalene was there, right. and he appeared unto her. He, he saw a woman. But there's another, I think I'm trying to find another picture that's maybe a little more uh, uh, Definitive, maybe um, maybe Luke, perhaps. Well, that's where he said, "Touch me not." Yeah, that's 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 what I want. What are you looking for? Now, when uh, the woman comes to the side and says, "Touch me not," right now, send me to the Father. Yeah, because see, he's got to meet a woman. Right. See, and because it's all, uh, let's see. Uh, well, where's it at? It's not a mark, eh? Is it? It can't be Mark. What are you looking for? Or Matthew. For? And beside raised, and uh, maybe the John comes to the garden. It's only four so called gospels. <laughs> 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 this is resurrection. Uh, yes, it's in John. John, uh, Sunday 11. I mean, the 20 of 11. I'm sorry. John 20 of 11. John 20 of 11. Mm -hmm. But Miriam stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seen two angels while white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Yahshua had laid. And they saw unto her, and they say unto her, Woman, why lookest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my rabbi, and I know not where he has laid, halfway they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Yahshua standing, and knew not that it, it was Yahshua. Mm -hmm. Yahshua says unto her, Woman, why is thou weeping? Why weepest thou? Thou seekest whom thou seekest. She supposing him to be the gardener, says unto him, Sir, if thou have bore him, hence tell me where thou hast laid him. And I will take them away. Yahshua answered, said unto Miriam. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabbi, Rabboni, and ran towards him, and she, and she might touch him. Yahshua said unto her, Touch me not, mm -hmm. but I go to my brother before I ascend to my father. Okay, good enough. Now he saw. When he got, came out the grave to my Yahshua, mm -hmm. he saw a woman, Mary Magdalene, and she was going to touch him, but he told her, touch me not. Why? Because that's what got you in trouble. <laughs> See, that's, that's, that's what got you in trouble back here. Right. See, touching this tree. Mm -hmm. See, tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
and then he was going to touch the tree of life, you know, right. it would have been carnal forever. But see, but Yahshua resurrecting is the tree of life, so in fulfillment of that commandment back there, don't touch me. Right. Just like you couldn't touch that tree. Mm -hmm. See, that's a fulfillment of that. And see, back here, here's Adam, he's in a deep sleep. And a, and a circumcision is, is exercised on him. He's, it's a spiritual immersion. The woman is immersed in Yahshua as a type here. So now the woman is, in other words, the woman is clothed in the sun. Right. But now the woman is taken out and presented to the man when he wakes. So when he wakes, there's a woman at his feet. Mm -hmm. Right? Just like Yahshua's fulfilling that. Just like we had Peter. When he comes up out of the prison, he's fulfilling that by meeting Rhoda. Okay? It's all correlated. You can even go into the book of Ruth. I think it's Ruth 3 and 4, maybe. Yeah, just read that quickly. Ruth 3 and 4. That Yahweh called Samuel. Ruth? Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> oh, kind of hard to get Samuel out of Ruth. Ruth Boys. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth 3 and 4. And it shall be when he lieth down mm -hmm. that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee thou down, and he will thee tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. Mm -hmm. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lie at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Okay, and look, it's the same thing here. Because Eve came out of Adam. Right. So she was a near kinsman. And so he expresses, you know, his skirt over him, figuratively speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a showing of Yahshua and his bride. And now I know they got this angel here. I don't know what, this is a misnomer. Because this angel should be way in the back right. somewhere. Because right. that angel is Satan. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, I said that right. It is Satan. Mm -hmm. Right? Somebody's oh, that's Yahshua. I'm saying, no, it is not Yahshua. Mm -hmm. That's Satan entering to Satan entering into the garden because as soon as she was taken out of the man, mm -hmm. here, here, here he comes, you know, because that's the same thing he did in the heavenly and the angelic creation. He went after the bride, okay? Spying on him. So, you know, so yeah, he's spying upon their nakedness, okay? But that's another, right. another lecture if y'all wish for me to pursue <laughs> that. But, you know, people, you, you have to study the charts. Mm -hmm. You have to engage them. And once you engage the charts, the charts will teach you and show you what to do, where to go. It'll show you things that are on this chart that you did not think were on this chart. Okay? All right, now let's go back here to Peter. I just wanted to bring those things out. Mm -hmm. See how much time we got. Carly. Okay. Now, let's go. Now, that, now we got up to here. Because if you notice here, it says AD 43, and over here, AD 52, the council at Jerusalem, and that's in Acts the 15th chapter. Let's go there so we can complete this play. But do you see now how when we start, I mean, we pulled, we pulled play 35, right. but to get a real more fuller explanation of this, we had to pull in, uh, what is it, play, uh, was play 34, which leads into 35, mm -hmm. and in the process we made our some correlations with plate 31, see, because this is resurrection reconfirmed, so you gotta go get the resurrection, 
of the Yahshua Messiah, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and then made the correlation with with the man Adam. Right. You know, all of this, the law and the prophet, because we went to the law with Adam, went to the prophets with Ruth, and then show how Yahshua was fulfilling it, Peter reconfirming it. Mm -hmm. All right? But now here we are, we're in AD 52 now, the, uh, the Council of Jerusalem. Okay? Okay. You want Acts 15? Acts 15th chapter. 15 and 1. Yes. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Mm -hmm. When therefore Saul and Barnabas had no disputation and disputation with, disputation with them, they determined that Saul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Mm -hmm. And being brought on their way by the congregation, they passed through Galicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the nations. And they caused great joy unto the, all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the congregation and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that Yahweh had done with them. But there rose up a certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needed to be circumcised, to circumcise them to the commandment, them to keep the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. And the apostles and the elders came together for to consider this matter. Okay, let's hold it right there. Now, the situation concerns the Gentiles, which right. we had expressed in the previous plate here in AD 40, that Yahweh poured the Holy Spirit on them as it did the Jews. All right? Now here we are 12 years later, there's a disputation, see? Because there were Pharisees that came into class. I'll just make it as colloquial as I can. <laughs> Pharisees came into class, and, uh, and, 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 and it's really not that unusual because Pharisees believed in the concept of mm -hmm. a resurrection. Right. All right. And there were Pharisees who actually did believe Yahshua the Messiah, you know, resurrected. Mm -hmm. For example, Nicodemus came to Yahshua at night. The tomb that Yahshua was buried in was donated by Joseph of Arimathea, who was a Pharisee. So Pharisees did believe in the concept of resurrection. It was the Sadducees who did not believe in the concept of resurrection, which is probably why they were sad, you see. Yeah. So, sad. So it's not unusual to, to see that there were Pharisees among the crowd here of believers. All right, but the, the problem was, they said, "Well, they still believe in carnal ordinances. They still believe that you had to adhere to the six hundred thirteen ordinances, uh, i.e., the law of Moses." And they felt like, "Well, why should the Gentiles have to get away with it? They got to become, they gotta, see, they they got to do the law too." Now, look, let me try to explain this. It was possible under the law of Moses for a Gentile to become a proselyte. That's somebody that will attach themselves right. onto a group. You become a proselyte. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, well, we'll let you be a proselyte if you swear that you will adhere to the 613 ordinances and that, you know, that kind of thing. And you know, if you marry a Hebrew, then your children will be Hebrew and that kind of, you know. 